welcome. Welcome back to this shared space. And as usual, take a moment to look around, see who's with us. See all the all the different ways we can suffer. <laughs> and all the different ways we can find peace and find freedom. It is so important to know, you know, that it's not just there is, uh, we talk about it as the path or a path, and there is a coherence to it, you know. And there's, we're all walking our own way, you know, through these bodies, these minds, these histories. on our own, together, the great mystery of how it unfolds. It's been just, um, struck, you know, every day with the interviews or the questions and answers of just how amazing everyone is doing and this sense of um, maybe that lack of uniformity, allowing people to understand themselves in their own ways and, you know, develop a schedule that meets your needs and your particular environment and the conditions of your mind and body right now. And, um, just how reassuring it is, you know, for all of us to see that, you know, I, I definitely this, I think, you know, a year ago when we started doing this, many people had this sense of like, oh, this is the, the backup, like the plan B is these self retreats at home with Zoom. And, you know, of course we'd rather be together in our, you know, these places away. And um, of course we value that so much, you know, it's like the, the, how much we all have benefited from these places, you know, and being able to come together and be taken care of. And, you know, the, the beauty of that is undeniable and the value of it. But it's also been really meaningful to see people really not feeling like this is secondary, right? Not not understanding that your practice is just as good if however we evaluate these things, you know, and that there are maybe things that we can explore in this way that are harder to explore actually when we're um, managing a shared, you know, environment, shared space. And yet recognizing the value of the structure and the support, the um, the ways that the kind of Dhamma infrastructure um, supports us, you know, and, and still enables us to do it um, in a way that feels good, coherent. Amazing always to hear these expressions of, you know, longing for liberation, for freedom, all the different ways, you know, people talk about it or experience it themselves, the language we use, uh, our visions for ourselves, our hopes, our aspirations, you know, our dreams around this path and 
how beautiful and tender and fragile, you know, whether we're attached to an idea of ourselves as or the, the enlightened version of ourselves, or if we feel too hesitant to even imagine that, um, the weight of, of that aspiration and that possibility is, is present, you know, how much it means to us, how much we respect it and care for this possibility of liberation. And how powerful and courageous and amazing it is to see all of us just in the, in the churning, you know, observing, trying to stay with, trying to feel our way through and understand, you know, these longings of the heart for safety, for satisfaction, for rest, for openness, for peace. And and I, I think that's always true on retreat that we see ourselves, you know, we see ourselves doing this. We see the way in which we're projecting a future experience of satisfaction or, or um, rest or relief onto the onto the present moment right this this sense of like it's coming you know if, if only this could happen or this version of ourselves in the future that's more awake you know that has more time or more whatever you know or or just the expressions of of satisfaction that we long for in terms of more basic things around food or uh um some pleasant experience in the future something whatever that may be you know and the the way that the heart clings to that as a way of managing its um sometimes sense of trappedness in what's happening right now in the present moment right that that whatever is happening now is difficult is uncomfortable is not satisfying <laughs> and and the ways of like seeing the ways in which in the mind heart will will try to anchor itself in a future experience a future moment of satisfaction of of relief of rest and how poignant that is and something i think now as this sort of year of quarantine and covid is coming to an end or appears to be changing <laughs> on some level. Uh, and, and there's more of a sense that people can return to things they were doing or things they want to do. All of us, you know, um, how powerful that is, you know. And how, and how poignant it is and how hard it is to remember in our meditation practice to pull that projection back, right? That the, the work is always like being so, it's like the, the sensitivity and the vulnerability to all these assertions of ourselves in the future of anchoring our happiness in some future experience when this thing happens or when we get the certain kind of satisfaction, you know, sensory, mental, emotional. And then we kind of, you know, are, kind of trying to pull ourselves to that. And how there is this stance of where are we trying to take care of ourselves? Where do we know that we need relief? We need rest. We need pleasant experience in our lives in order to be able to manage the intensity of the hardship. And where do we also when we've developed the concentration and the mindfulness and the forces that you're cultivating, where do we also have the ability to, to, to not to believe in the fantasy, right? To pull back on the projection and say, oh, right, the heart is wanting stability. It's so wishing for something pleasant, for something good, for something stable, for something satisfying in the future. And that what part of us recognizes always that it's never gonna be satisfying. 
Not really. Doesn't mean things can't be helpful, pleasant, good, right? I mean, there's where you can hear in our talks and in our it's like there's plenty of room for that. There's there's a reason why we hold the word treat is in the middle of retreat, you know, that like we know we need treats of all kinds, you know, to keep ourselves going. And to not kid ourselves, right? To to also see how we long for it. And then it's so fleeting, the pleasure, you know, it's so rare that something is satisfying for more than a few moments, you know, really. And where do we also feel the strength to be honest with ourselves about that? Feel the ache, feel the pain, know on a deep level that the satisfaction is never gonna come from the from the object from achieving the sense thing even if it's achieving our enlightenment this the satisfaction the peace this the the liberation is always right now it's always in showing up for what's actually happening right now of course living in hawaii we see this always but especially right now you know as the restrictions have kind of come down and it's just unreal flood of tourism and um, people just freaking out to get out of there wherever they've been trapped you know for the last year <laughs> is how they you know how many people feel and so of course it's like so understandable the sense of like you know why <laughs> You wouldn't be surprised how many tourists die in Hawaii every year. It's like unreal, you know? And a lot of it is this, like, the, the energy of trying to escape and run from one's life <laughs> and run from aspects of our reality, the recklessness that can come with that, you know? And whether it's like, uh, you know, just drunkenness, right, in terms of like, a big part of vacationing for a lot of people, whether it's really just doing dangerous things in terms of the ocean or in terms of the forest and, you know, helicopter bungee jumping over the volcano, you know, it's like, huh, it's like very interesting. And so this, also that for ourselves and in, in, in the moment, where do we see that? You know, where do we see the the recklessness that can come from just the overwhelm and, and the, the sense of like panic of needing to get out of whatever's happening, you know? And how we have to then live with whatever that is, you know, and understand it, understand that the recklessness itself is actually a longing. It's like the times where we can feel like the uprightness and the ethics of the um, carefulness with our conduct can feel like too much of a prison, you know, it doesn't feel like a relief. It doesn't feel uh, liberating. It feels confining in the sense of like wanting to be free of care, wanting to be free of responsibility, you know, in our action. of course how understandable it is you know the weight of our responsibility in each moment can feel heavy can feel like a burden we want a vacation from our karma there is no vacation from our karma mm. And so it's like recognizing the beauty of this longing, the pain of it, and honoring how hard it is. How just the mind can be just squirming, you know, trying to be with what is instead of leaning into anchoring in what we want.
Hmm. Where do we hold that deeper longing for relief and release and peace with what's happening? Remembering that, you know, enlightenment is never you know, it's like sometimes it feels, it's like this isn't just about wanting, a, of course there's the level of, you know, wanting to get out, wanting a vacation, wanting something else, but even just our own liberation, you know, our feeling of awakening, you know, it, sometimes the sense of, oh, this enlightenment is right around the corner or some release is right around the corner. And just remembering that it's, enlightenment is never around the corner. It's always right now. There's no other way to it. But how hard it is to, to just make that little shift, to just get underneath, you know, that little shift of getting underneath the perspective, the projection. in the sense of how fleeting everything is, how difficult it is to be with that, how we, you know, the, the impulse to let go of future self, future becoming, future experiences of pleasure. It's like, oh, how, what, what does that mean living without hope? Right, because what is hope besides a clinging to some future experience? you know, future reality. How lost we feel without that sometimes. And remembering that we don't need to let it go. We don't, it's like, you know, we'll, we'll say over and over, it's like, of course, the mind is trying to anchor in something that it hopes will happen, a satisfaction, an outcome. Um, but is there a deeper, way to operate, right? If it's not with the expectation of something pleasurable or something good or something we want, what is the motivation? Why do we act at all? If we let go of hope, does that mean we're living in hopelessness? And how is, what is the release of hope that isn't despair, right? That's actually a, a liberation of the heart, an ease of the mind, a, taking ourselves out of the prison, but also taking the world out of the prison of our longing, of our controlling. I've, over the years, you know, since I've been here, planted a lot of fruit trees. You know, Vipassana Hawaii has had some land in Kohala, and just little by little, this mangoes and soursop trees and breadfruit and orange, citrus trees, bananas, avocados. And of course, it's, it's, it's done with this sort of uh, hope of, of building something, right? Of, of, of being able to create a garden in the future that that I will um, benefit from, you know, that I will be able to eat these mangoes someday, you know, that I will be able to eat these avocados someday, um, that we'll have a, and what that means in terms of, oh, Vipassana Hawaii, you know, we'll have a place and blah, blah, blah. All, all of like, how much is, is invested in the, the planting of a tree and how important it has been for me over the years of also, right, not stopping that, not trying to inhibit that, but also going to a deeper place, right, of understanding a million things could happen and which I will never taste the fruit of these trees. In fact, it's more likely that I will never 
right? And so then why do it? And of course, the answer is so obvious and so much better, right? That it's like, you do it out of just generosity, right? You plant these things, not actually for your own satisfaction in the future, but because you know someone will benefit. Someone will enjoy these mangoes, these breadfruit, these sour sop. And so there's a goodness in two ways, you know, there's the goodness of in the moment of not being invested in that personal expectation. Someone was saying today in an interview of their, uh, another translation of that um, Patachara uh, poem is, you know, when she says, where is my harvest of all the effort I'm putting in, right? Where's my harvest? <laughs> And that sense of like, oh yeah, where is that? It's so painful for our own hearts and painful for the world, mine. And where do we just do it? Because it's good, because it's the right thing. Even if all of humanity is erased, the pigs will eat these mangoes, the worms will eat them. Someone will enjoy them who who are we to have a preference you know to have an agenda with the vast flood of unseen and unknowable incidents that can happen and what a relief of a way to be in the world and it doesn't have to exclude the heart that contracts around expectation, around wanting, around uh, the, the hope of future satisfaction. It's actually, it's through that understanding, through letting the heart contract, well, letting the heart want, seeing the, the pain and the folly of it, the harm that can come from it internally and externally uh, that we understand. And in that understanding, unbind, unhook, release. Ah, oh, we don't, the mind doesn't, isn't enchanted by the, hope and the expectation of future satisfaction, of sense dependency of happiness on sense pleasure. It sees the deeper happiness, the deeper fruit, the fruit that's available right now of peace, of kindness, of generosity, of, of ease of heart in that giving and that offering to the world. Then it gives again in the future. This is from the Udana. The Buddha said, this world is subject to torment, afflicted by contact. It calls the disease self. For however it is conceived, it is ever otherwise than that. Becoming something other, the world is held by becoming. It is afflicted by becoming, and yet it delights in becoming. What it delights in brings fear. What it fears is suffering. Now this holy life is lived in order to abandon becoming. Whatever recluses and Brahmins have said that freedom from being comes about through some kind of being, none of them, I say, are freed from being. And whatever recluses and Brahmins have said that escape from being comes through non-being, none of them, I say, have escaped from being. The suffering arises dependent upon clinging. With the end of all grasping, no suffering is produced. Look at the people in the world afflicted by ignorance coming into being, delighted in being, 
not freed. Whatever forms of being exist in any way, anywhere, all these forms of being and becoming are impermanent, subject to suffering of a nature to change. On seeing this as it actually is with perfect wisdom, the craving for becoming is abandoned. Yet one does not delight in non-being. Nibbana is the total dispassion and cessation, cessation attained with the complete destruction of craving. A bhikkhu whose cravings are extinguished by not grasping has no renewal of being, no becoming. Delusion is vanquished, the battle is won. The stable one has passed beyond all forms of being, of becoming. That stability of going beyond all forms of becoming. How beautiful, right? How, what a relief, this sense of uh, this, this leaning into the future, this, this, it's, it's not, it's a, it's the, the sense of like how central it is to our suffering, right? It's the cra it's the, the craving, the grasping towards something that leads to this becoming, right? This sense of moving into a future moment of being and any sense that our, uh, our liberation is in, is, is in a future moment of being. Or becoming, or or the idea that it's in the destruction of becoming, either of those are wrong, right? The sense of like, you, it's not about that. It's not about the object. It is not about whatever is being leaned in towards. It's the stability of watching sense experience arise, watching pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, seeing, understanding the heart that contracts, having compassion for the heart that contracts that feels fear, that feels a sense of longing for the stability of sense pleasure. But of course, a heart that gets wider and wider and more and more stable so that it doesn't need it, right? It abandons the suffering that comes through that clinging as well. You know, there are these four practices known as the guardian meditations. And they help us understand the ways in which we need the buoyancy and the inspiration. And we also need the relinquishment and renunciation and the letting go. Reflections on the virtues of the Buddha. Reflection on the 32 parts of the body. Reflections on loving kindness and reflection on death. Right, the sense of death being this, for us, ultimate contemplation of non-becoming, you know, something we have a hard time conceiving beyond, right, of what our experience is there. How silly in a way, right? We have, we have the arrogance to think we can imagine what's going to happen in five minutes or 10 minutes, but there's this thing called death, which seems oh, somewhere beyond that, that is, and has a beyond beyond that, that's a, a blank, you know, or maybe we have a belief about it but how honored that is in this tradition around the same thing of seeing how much we have invested in being and becoming bhava and the practices of, of renunciation, of letting that go, of rehearsing. Recently, someone sent uh, Steve a video that was um, supposedly of a, a monk in Burma who through his, you know, incredible sensitivity to the life force and the karma that was unfolding for him, 
had a knowledge of the precise moment that he was going to die. And so this film is of a ceremony that was held of all these folks gathered around, this monk sitting in his chair. And when everything is ready, he stands up and he lies down and everyone's just quiet and watching. And at some point you see his, the body just kind of relax. His arm drops to the side. And it appears that they take this as the sign that he has died and they gather him and they put him in a coffin and they carry him out. And there's a ceremonial kind of procession around um, to whatever happens next. And it's quite an amazing thing to watch, as you can imagine, and certainly something that is held to be possible in this tradition, right? That um, people can have that level of clarity and understanding of the momentum of their own life force, right? And have it be that precise and, and, and that kind of awareness really honored. There are also apparently practices of rehearsing one's death um, that may look something quite like this footage. And I think to me, there's something so astounding either way, right? That like, whether this was actually a footage of someone Knowing, they, knowing exactly when they were going to die and dying and everyone just like holding that as honoring that essentially a miracle. Or if that capacity to let go of being and becoming is so deeply honored in the tradition that taking a lot of people and doing a lot of ceremony and ritual and kind of having it be a very big production to help someone rehearse that process to whatever point, being in the coffin, I, you know, they don't, I don't know what happens next, but um, how amazing that is, how wonderful that is. how pure that is to understand how difficult it is for the human heart to go through that process, to, to go through it with this steadiness of mind, with our access to compassion and care, especially with whatever discomfort physically that might be arising, emotional pain that might be arising, mental um, lack of capacity that might be there. how wonderful a practice and it is whether regardless of this video or whatever that it is it is an important practice in our tradition of this reflecting on death recognizing that all beings will die and we too will die whether more generally or you know this being that i'm with this person this animal you know the, like the the acknowledgement of that and the seeing the potency of that for the heart. Recognizing there's times where that feels unbearable to the heart and recognizing the times where it feels like the heart knows it'll be okay. Right? Not trying to force the insight, not trying to force the understanding, but the recognition of like, oh, there are times where the mind does know deeply and trusts in the truth that all things will pass. And it's okay with that. And then there are conditions in our lives, conditions in the mind and the body that, that make it more difficult in a time. And that's why we have it as a practice, as a baseline of something to come back to. To see, oh, how conditioned the mind is at different points 
to be accepting or to be clinging or to be fearful of that experience. There's a, m- many folks have heard of the Myantang uh, Sayidao, you know, from different ones of us, the Happy Sayidao. Sometimes people referred to him as, who was the neighboring monk at the Chazwa Monastery that we've been in relationship with for so long. He was this just amazing, amazing, wonderful, deep, quiet, joyful uh, being. And um, he died at some point when we were not there. And I remember the the next time, or it was some years later, uh, came back to Chazwa, had been back, but um, this time it was Darine was there and our friend Jake before the retreat began. And we went up to the pagoda at the top of his monastery, you know, the, the, the these, these hills in the Sagaing uh, area that some of you know. And um, so the monastery sort of is down at the bottom, and but they, they have a little pagoda up at the top of the hill and it's a beautiful view of the Irrawaddy River and of the Sagaing Hills. So we went for a walk up there and um, went to his pagoda the, up at the top. And the 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 new Sayada, the new abbot at his monastery, was happened to be up there, who we knew and really you know love a lot. And um, Jake was able to translate and you know speak with him. And he said, "Oh, he's like, would you like to would you like to see Sayada?" And it was sort of this moment of confusion because obviously Sayada had passed away, Miyatang Sayada had passed away, and he said, "Okay, sure." And he got a, took out a key and he opened the side of this pagoda, and um, unbeknownst to us, that there all of these years that his Sayada's body was buried there in a glass coffin, and so. He was so happy. To, he was like, oh, don't you want to see? <laughs> He's like, come, look, you know. Someone had a vision, and, and we decided it was time to open this. And so we've looked and, you know, uh, go on in. And so you go into this little hole, and you sit next to this glass coffin where Sayyidah's body is decomposing. This was maybe four years after he had died. And just pure Dhamma. We can be so inspired by, of course, you know, teachers who develop incredible concentration, insight, and may develop these amazing powers of, you know, miraculous abilities. And those are intended to be inspiring. They're intended to be faith-inducing, you know, like how amazing the mind is and what the human heart is capable of. Miracles, you know. And they have their place. And yet this encounter with just the decaying body of someone we knew and loved and so deeply revered and appreciated no magic, no miracles, just bugs, ooze, right? Skull, sinews, his glasses still on, his robe still on. Such such a profound teaching and such an offering, right? That with his last, this, it's not typical that people do this, even in Burma, monks, you know, often there's funeral pyres or there's, you know, different practices, but this idea that with the last, you know, with his, the last moments of, uh, you know, becoming in the mind and, you know, death as we may call it, 
to have that commitment to teaching the purity and simplicity of the Dhamma, of letting go of what is next, of understanding nature, of not fighting nature, of honoring it and understanding that this is all we need to observe, things passing. And because he was so loving and because we loved him and because the joy of the tradition of honoring this kind of thing, it's, it's, it has a, there's a buoyancy of the mind that is there, right? To be with friends doing this, you know, to have that sense of shared Dhamma companionship, to witness something that outside of that context might be totally horrifying, right? Very upsetting, disturbing, whatever. But in this context and in this reverence, it's like the perfect teaching. How powerful the Dhamma is in that way. The stability of mind, the stability of heart provided for by equanimity, by love, by compassion, by sangha, by lineage, you know, of not running from the truth, not hiding or obfuscating the truth, not trying to make it something else. That sober beauty of the truth. Even the Buddha, when he passed away, was heading into Parinibbana. There's a lot of kind of, you know, of course, mythology around it. And um, he had made some commitments to not die, not, not leave until um, certain things were in order. And at the end of his life, Mara, you know, the embodiment of delusion, sort of trickster energy comes and says, okay, it is now time, Reverend Sir, for the Lord's final Nibbana. <laughs> These words were spoken by the Lord. And he quotes the Buddha himself. I will not attain final Nibbana until my bhikkhu disciples are wise, my bhikkhuni disciples are wise, my, I'm going to go through all of them, lay male followers, lay female followers, all of them are wise, uh, disciplined, confident, attained to security from bondage, learned, experts in dhamma, practicing according to dhamma, practicing the proper way, living by following dhamma, nor until after learning it, from their own teachers, they will be able to expound, announce, teach, declare, establish, reveal, expound and explain. Nor until refuting with Dhamma the arisen theories of others, they will also be able to teach Dhamma that is convincing. And so Mara reminds him, he's like, that's all done. It's all accomplished. It's time to go. <laughs> And he agrees. And it says, it was then at the Kapala shrine that the Lord, mindful and clearly comprehending, relinquished the life force. And when the Lord had relinquished the life force, different translation, right, with the Lord, a great earthquake occurred and the fearful hair-raising peal of thunder rent the air. And on realizing its significance, the Buddha uttered on that occasion, this inspired utterance. The sage relinquished the force of being, which originates the measurable and immeasurable. Inwardly happy and composed, he sundered personal existence like a coat of armor. Something about that, um, 
he didn't just die right away. There's, of course, this momentum of past karma still had to unfold, you know, it was several months, you know, would still happen, would still go by. But this sense of happily and composed, of uh, understanding that it was appropriate and natural, right? No resistance. What a relief. And so we have these to remember, yes, the reflections on death, but also in the, you know, the joy of the recollections of the virtue of the Buddha, the virtues of the Buddha, not outside of that, not distinct. It's like, these are all these important qualities of the heart. The soberness of the reflections on the 32 parts of the body, and then the upliftment of loving kindness. And if you haven't listened to the, um, there is a, on the resources page on the Oriana, you know, the uh, chant by our dear friend Sele Makamalanyani, a nun in Burma living outside of Yangon right now, who's helped teach at the Chazwa retreat now for some years. and. She um, sent us a recording of herself chanting it and then the, the words to it. And of course it may relate, people may relate to it differently. It's a little more sort of religious, a little more, um, rooted in, in the context of a lineage, which isn't, doesn't always resonate. Sometimes things can feel sort of archaic or not totally in alignment with our not resonant always with how we feel about the teachings and the Dhamma. But the beauty of also just the vo her voice and the tone, you know, these recollections of the Buddha. He's omniscient. A person who is worthy of veneration or accomplished, araham. Fully enlightened or rightly self-awakened, samasambuddha endowed with supreme knowledge and virtuous conduct, well-spoken or sublime, knower of the world, the incomparable leader capable of taming all beings, teacher of gods and humans, awakened, blessed. You know, remembering these are things that of course, we venerate an honor in someone else, but also the idea is we don't feel ourselves as distinct, as separate from that potential, from that possibility. How beautiful this possibility of worthiness, of accomplishment, of awakening, clarity, of uprightness of conduct. Iti piso bagawa Araham sama sambuno Vija charana sambano Sungato loka winu Anutaro purisa damasarati Sata deva manusanam Bundo bagawa Can we take in the beauty of that? Seeing that our access to that expands with our acceptance of death, of letting go of becoming, of the places where we don't need to assert ourselves into a future moment. Or when we do, we have the ability to care about it to understand the pain of human existence, of these bodies, these minds. Mm, understand, have care for that, have that soothing quality of that, something like that chant or others. 
settle the heart and mind. You know, to recognize all these parts of the body broken down, meant to be disenchanting. The hair of the head, the hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bone, marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, membranes, spleen, lungs, bowels, mesentery, gorge, dung, brain, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of joints, urine, <laughs> people will accuse meditators of being disembodied. Mm, not if you're doing it right. right. And, and to understand that, that the love, right, the, the kindness, the care of like for all of the, for the, like the teeth and the spleen, right? That it's like, you can't have one without the other, right? We, the, these things go together, right? The aspiration and the beauty of recognition of awakening and the fathoming and acceptance of death. The materiality, the mundane and decaying, sweating reality <laughs> of the body, you know? And the total ability to love free from conditions, no restraint. Just what you're going through, right? That everything that you are going through is part of the process. Helps build the one or the other sides of this incredible, beautiful, shining, liberating path of awakening. And so this truth of the beauty and the warmth of the love and the coolness, the quenchedness, right? The relief of just <sighs> a thought comes to the end and there's no need to throw out a new one. Some fantasy comes to the end, the breath comes to an end those moments that are there, you're maybe not always noticing on that. It's just there, but they're there where it's okay. It's okay if nothing happens next. And it's okay if something happens next. That coolness, that peace that allows for the love, that gives us a platform, the ability to connect with that care. What use is there for a well if there's water everywhere? When craving's root is severed, what should one go about seeking? That coolness can be scary, right? It's, it, it doesn't have the feeling of us in a very strong way. It doesn't have that thing that we think we're used to of who we are. And so it is a relinquishment. It is a tr faith in letting go of needing to keep reasserting ourselves to reassure ourselves that we're here and we're going to continue to be here. And of course, that care, the patience with the, the mind that needs to do that, that feels it needs that stability. And where is the coolness? Where is the acceptance? Where is the peace? And also, when we do have access to that peace, when it does arise because of conditions, where do we learn to let go of the peace as well? Where do we let to 
Learn to let go of the attachment to the coolness, to the acceptance. Is there enough faith to know what happens then? This is what the Buddha said to Bahia, or uttered after Bahia died. Where neither water nor earth, nor fire nor air gain a foothold, there gleam no stars, no sun sheds its light. There shines no moon, and yet there no darkness reigns. When a sage, a Brahmin, has come to know this for themselves through their own wisdom, then they are freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. Sit for a moment. What use is there for a well when there is water everywhere? Take good care and we'll see you shortly for the metta chanting and sit.